you for coming. It's more than we expected. <laughs> We're moving, and we thought we would uh, read some poetry at you before we left. So I'm going to read for uh, half an hour or so, and then Sarah's going to come up and do the same. And I'll come back for another 15 minutes and read some newer stuff. Uh, I'm not going to just read my own things. But you can, can you hear me in the back yeah. row? Is that fine? Okay, good. So I don't have to yell and scream. <laughs> and I, I want to start with a poem by Thomas Hardy. Um, back in the 19th century, all kinds of books warned women about you know, the horrible consequences of being seduced. And this is a slightly different take on that. Uh, there's some uh, unfamiliar words. Uh, docks are onions. Uh, a barton is a farm or an estate. Uh, megrims are something like uh, fits of depression, melancholy, something like that. And to sock is kind of to sulk. This, this poem is called The Ruined Maid. Oh, Amelia, my dear, this does everything crown. Who could have supposed I should meet you in town? And whence such fair garments, such prosperity? Oh, didn't you know I'd been ruined, said she? You left us in tatters, without shoes or socks, tired of digging potatoes and sputting up docks. And now you've gay bracelets and bright feathers three. Yes, that's how we dress when we're ruined, said she. <laughs> At home in the Barton you said thee and thou and sitcoon and thassoon and t'other, but now you're talking quite fitzy for high company. Some polish is gained with one's ruin, said she. Your hands were like paws then, your face blue and bleak, but now I'm bewitched by your delicate cheek and your little gloves fit as on any lady. We never do work when we are ruined, said she. <laughs> you used to call home life a hag-ridden dream, and you'd sigh and you'd suck, but at present you seem to know not of megrims or melancholy. True, one's pretty lively when ruined, said she. <laughs> I wish I had feathers, a fine sweeping gown, and a delicate face, and could strut about town. My dear, a raw country girl such as you be cannot quite expect that. You ain't ruined, said she. <laughs> I'm going to uh, read a few poems from every decade that I've been in Albuquerque. You know, I've been here for a while. Uh, this is the oldest thing that I still have. Uh, I made it the last four lines of my poem, uh, Liquid Ladder 05, but it was actually written uh, long before that, in 1968. Ooh. There you are, standing your back to me. Shall I come up behind you and touch your shoulder? Your stance is passive, your eyes perhaps regarding something I can't see, hidden by your body. This is from the 1970s. Uh, from the imagery, I guess it was written sometime around finals week of spring semester, and right after one of the spectacular thunderstorms we get. Pause in a rhythm. Brave rain left the streets celebrant in cicada soft blackness, tame with voices and typing from yellow windows, with gutters of fluttering lamplight, with lanes of dense odor drained from the breathing leaves. Where the ravenous bolts kindled the blank air, the prolonged passion of mud gathers and rises in a young, unconscious worship unimpeded by cedars drooping ligaments or subtle ecstasy of the child moon. In the gaunt no place of spirit, the vision flexes and wakes, scrubbed of face and name, aimed and unmoored astride the cruising cloud. This is a poem by Sharon Olds. I go back to May 1937. I see them standing at the formal gates of their colleges. I see my father strolling out under the ochre sandstone arch, the red tiles glinting like bent plates of blood behind his head. I see my mother with a few light books at her hip standing at the pillar made of tiny bricks, the wrought iron gate still open behind her, its sword tips aglow in the May air. They are about to graduate. They are about to get married. They are kids. They are dumb. All they know is they are innocent. They would never hurt anybody. I want to go up to them and say, Stop. Don't do it. She's the wrong woman. 
He's the wrong man. You are going to do things you cannot imagine you would ever do. You are going to do bad things to children. You are going to suffer in ways you have not heard of. You are going to want to die. I want to go up to them there in the late May sunlight and say it, her hungry, pretty face turning to me, her pitiful, beautiful, untouched body, his arrogant, handsome face turning to me, his pitiful, beautiful, untouched body. But I don't do it. I want to live. I take them up like the male and female paper dolls and bang them together at the hips like chips of flint as if to strike sparks from them. I say, do what you are going to do, and I will tell about it. Uh, the poem from the 1980s actually comes from the last time I lived in Washington State. Uh, not exactly where we're going, but nearby. Uh, it has some familiar biblical imagery, but it also references the uh, Pueblo creation stories where the people came up from the green world where everything is soft and not yet ripe into the hard world where we live today. Adam expelled, and I did eat. The garden ripened softness into toughness, the browsing seed into the dropping fruit. Knowledge brought hardness, sight showed the blatant contours of the world, its balancing in an instant of space, my blurred bemusement in it gone, and circling everything, the melancholic stain, like a hinge-jawed, shining snake. It was never innocence. It was greenness. And it was not a fall. It was a purging of the eyes. Decision watered the earth. Desire loaned it. And the fruit was in my hand. Can I ask to be restored to that unfocused spot? To be cradled in hugeness as if it were clarity? I am larger than it now. My own heart wields the flaming sword I will not cross. From the 1990s, a little thing called short film submission. There isn't any music playing in the background. She comes home and there isn't any music to indicate that something's about to happen. She puts the mail on the table without opening it, but we don't notice this because there's no close-up of the mail. No camera pursues her to the fridge, so we never know if she's hungry or just has the munchies or just pulls the door open and stands staring the few seconds it takes her to think better of whatever idea she had. She might hug herself in her arms or not, and according to our background evidence, it might be raining or not, and she might be in one of those echoey places with blonde hardwood that makes her face bones seem distinct against white walls and her face skin burrowed with light and burrowed with dark. This could be the scene with the sudden slasher or the scene with the sarcastic girlfriend on the phone or the scene with the syringe and overdose, but we wait a while and get no information what kind of scene it is. She enters the bathroom, and we aren't permitted any voyeur's shot of loosened legs or style of shoulder, no knowledge of what surprising things she has on beneath what other accustomed things. There is no pan back or cut to the unopened mail. When she cries, nothing builds to her. No hand hesitates to place itself anywhere on her. No dialogue helps us feel our way into this or through it. Nothing does the explaining. When she's finished, she's finished, and she'll have to do something else, and so will we. There isn't any music playing in the background. <laughs> Two poems by my late friend Lee Wilson, whom some of you knew. I want for her good planets. Her pears are yellow, and apples are red. With sky at the top, house in the middle, Bolts from pretty suns that dad stands under, tie blown out by wind in town's grid turned green. I want, like she wants, to walk dappled paths in orchards lace weave and to sleep in nests before tall on lines between sky and land we lust for dark oceans. The fish are down there all the time. 
and they never get any towels or blankets, and their mothers don't twist their ears to make the water come out, and they never get any French fries. <laughs> I have uh, three poems from the uh, first decade of the 21st century. This one is from 2001, called The Last Ship from Atlantis. The world burns in the night. Salt tightens my nostrils as prow cuts water, unshapen now beyond the pillars, a mirror blotted not by fire but the loss of it. The world burns, but I still take your hand, miles beneath me now, and green as the snow on our mountain tops. Green as our white gates gape to streams of horses, jangling gold, bickering ivory, the saddle sizzling in the scornful noon. I still take your hand and kiss your airless mouth as the dark sky beneath the dark sky speeds away without changing, and deep winds cross us to wretched destinations and slap us back even from there. Hilarious to lose you to the flying, bleeding rocks when I remember how you could melt the earth with a sniff and gesture of face in that walk of yours, tall as a star. We lay in the cool of the dry peaks and the cool of our sweet sweat, the mild lime squares of ambergris still buckled around your bare hips, toes and fingers colored after king's gowns or eyelids. Lifted on an elbow, you swept the sea and the gloried island with your other arm, saying, Gift, and gift was given. Nor did you and I have anything to do with the givings and takings of gods, with barters or oaths, sins or merits. Gift was the cry of finding, the cry of forsaking, the same cry from your upward broken lips and the sleep that doused you like June storms so your thought could scamper in drifted buildings. The hot, small flower you drew along my cheek was the smash of our strange armadas, our slaveries, our crawling vaults. Oh, we were everything they killed us for. I carry that like a tomb in my open fists. We landed on the world like a hawk with a voice all hunger and harm Hunger and harm were the flags of our plazas, the tribute of our tax, the bread we threw in the wine. I will say you were innocent with all this murder in your hair to the roots, because this is how you were born, a tongue of rich pallor dressed in thieves' grabbings. And I will say I am condemned, though I was born how you were, one of the hawk's dead figures, because it wasn't worth pleasure or any wakeful thing took me to the harbor this morning, just dim desire to look on the lying sea. And when the crap of our victories, the drench of our sciences, the cripples of our hopes began to flog the ground to bits in gnashes of smoke and heavenly vine of flame and spattered lace of screams, I made no attempt to run between the nodding walls and under the gods' own clouds the hills to you. I sat out from shore with a few dried men, shrunk too small for our clothes, our shoes, and watched you taken under all day long, while the mountains spilled like suns, and the god's sun lowered into faceless red ocean, and the thing was complete, and a night blew up, and a wind. We turned ourselves and passed the pillars. I know you would have me bring something rescue to a land we may or may not reach and bring it bravely, but the bravery itself is all I've rescued, and it does me as much good as my love does now. Behind my back, where the fear went down with the love, the world burns, not for a sign or teaching, and not to marry its black elements to a last or first light, but because world swallowed you and you world and drowned or undrowned, you burn. This one comes from uh, 2004, called Against the Drone. Outside the laundromat, the hair blows over my eye, thinner than the air's rivers. 
Inside, the drunk in the brittle black wardrobe who looks like he ought to go into the washer hole <laughs> finishes a giant sack of junk food and then starts asking people for money. Me, he calls brother man, or that's my guess, my detective work on the warped syllables. My team came in, yells the beard in the cushioned vest as quarters jackpot out of the change machine. But it wasn't only a gag. Denver! Denver's kicking their ass, he announces to the room. The drunk's par, shiner covering a stab scab, comes up and high-fives the beard. They tell each other, Denver, a couple times. <laughs> I wouldn't be here except the laundry room in my buildings caught fire last month. The sign on the door says, temporary closed. It was the second fire in one week. I first took out my back fence, and now our yard is twice as big. I stood across the street, squeezing the popcorning cat in my arms, wearing dumb indoor clothes. The firemen weren't in much of a rush either time. All in a day's work, when the flames take more of the world, brother man. <laughs> and this one comes from um, 2007. Peace. Not quite noon. The earth still toppling away from night, the dead middle of night, where the sun sits. The dead house finch in my driveway hasn't been disturbed by any violence, even a death in midair. Really, it looks like it walked there and huddled asleep like a human, a shoulder lifted a bit to shade the glare of cracked mud, its one-dimensional feet flung limp as if sleep finally couldn't be fought. I scrape it into a bag, of course, and convey it to the dumpster, saying I'm sorry to the empty world. And it fits and falls there. This time it falls between a pizza delivery box and the box a pump-up air mattress came in. Another slit of harsh red-brown deep down the high brightness. I think I am thinking of peace. Here is a poem by Richard Wilbur, perhaps our best living poet. And I find this a rather moving poem, although I disagree with the last line. <laughs> it's called Cottage Street, 1953. Framed in her Phoenix fire screen, Edna Ward bends to the tray of Canton, pouring tea for frightened Mrs. Plath, then turning toward the pale, slumped daughter and my wife and me, asks if we would prefer it weak or strong. Will we have milk or lemon, she inquires. The visit seems already strained and long. Each in his turn we tell her our desires. It is my office to exemplify the published poet in his happiness, thus cheering Sylvia, who has wished to die. But half ashamed and impotent to bless, I am a stupid lifeguard who has found, swept to his shallows by the tide, a girl who far from shore has been immensely drowned and stares through water now with eyes of pearl. How large is her refusal and how slight the genteel chat whereby we recommend life of a summer afternoon despite the brewing dusk which hints that it may end. And Edna Ward shall die in fifteen years after her eight and eighty summers of such grace and courage as permit no tears, the thin hand reaching out, the last word, love. Outliving Sylvia, who condemned to live, shall study for a decade as she must, to state at last her brilliant negative in poems free and helpless and unjust. I think he's judging her by the same handful of poems that uh, people like her for, which are neither typical nor the best. Uh, two poems from uh, the current decade. Um, this one, both of them written in uh, 2012. And this is called uh, One Bird. A pigeon alone on school cement as I walk to my office hour and then three-hour class, close to the footpath, but on Saturday not likely to be bothered by many, doesn't run aside as I pass, watches me but not bobbing and cooing in fear, no fear evident, and no constellation of others I have to wind among. 
a solitary. I'm ill at what should be the end of a cold that won't leave. I have a couple only symptoms of pneumonia, and it's January, so my head darts to Lee, who died of it this month, eight years ago, and to death and leaving the loved. And there's a factoid somewhere that says pigeons mate for life, and this one being by itself means it's a widow, a widower, who's decided to put itself relentless in a human area and not fly and wait for the cats. Or, I think, maybe it just can't fly. I turn at my alien bicameral face, tell it hi, call it some pet name, passing so near I'm amazed again how calm it is. Cut to four hours later on my way home, I see it again, walk by just as narrow, same behavior, same lack of fear, same absence of others, but this one's blocks away from school, one street away from mine, can't possibly be the same bird. I can't tell pigeons apart, Lee could. He kept them for a year or two around college time, had a coop in his backyard, a score of birds, all indistinguishable, all named. <laughs> I say hello again, continue on. For the next 24 hours, wild winds sweep over my heart. And this final poem is called Hurricane. <clears throat> In the last month of the first year of my seventh decade, I'm hoping after this sleep, you can wake to another flavor in the air of yourself, brought and uncovered by the God you pray to, whom I've considered praying to for you after 30 years of atheism, at least holding you in my mind before him, holding you out in my mind in my losing dark gulf of what passes in me for thinking before whatever can give you rejection of the wish to die. I can't add words to these apparent prayers because I have nothing to say to anybody but you. And, if, and in case I'm unheard and have to live without you again, these words will be over. In the last month of the first year of my sixth decade, I see you less frequently since you split up with Nate, but also see how heavy and colorless that was for you. You bring me the heavy, colorless thing to see on your shoulders, in front of your walk, far into your eyes. Every night my own weight squeezes out of me through a gibbering fart hole, and I pour in it, in me, the wine, and the slander of love, and the night I can't take, and the day I love to leave. In the last month of the first year of my fifth decade, Lee and I have made it through our little crises of health and of fidelity, and it looks like the remaining bumps ahead will involve the decision where under the sun to put Lee's strong garden, seeing our shady, smoke-licked rooms have the strength of green growth anyway. A thing in me, a great thing, dreads a house, which would smell like the past, not the future, an experience for my twenties, pointless then, let alone now. But I seldom look any further than this weekend's couple of six-packs, and been a while since we did that one puzzle. In the last month, of the first year of my fourth decade, we arrive in the same northwest town, I realize, where an officer and a gentleman was filmed. This little blue motel's corny name's unmistakable. Maybe if I land a job and have any money left over, they'll let me stay in the room where that gear winger sex scene happened. I don't think I'll worry about a job very soon, though. The liberty, I feel, is even better than being near the sea air again. I miss my baby son but his hate of being handed back and forth was getting violent. I can walk everywhere. At night, double the number of stars as Albuquerque, even with the vast yellow dial of the courthouse clock. In the last month of the first year of my third decade, I walk up the 13-mile dirt road back into Chama Canyon to the monastery. The monks are in awe. I tell them if a car had come by, I would have snagged a lift. I'm glad one didn't. That road was my opportunity to lay dramatic distance between my life and theirs, which I'm now joining for a week. I know from previous trips it takes a few days for the world to sift down low enough in your body that it can't be heard, and God and his mother and all the saints and angels fade in hard in the sunlight. In the last month of the first year of my second decade, my counselor strips my cot three times 
tosses the mattress on the floor three times, and three times makes me make it again. Perfect. Hospital corners. He's that man. If you'd stuck to the first lie, he says, no matter what, even when you had to elaborate it and it got more outlandish and flimsier, that would have been one thing. I could have thought, this kid's a pathological liar for some reason. I heard of that. Not the kind of thing someone can help. But tonight, when you all of a sudden admitted the truth and denied you'd ever lied about it at all, that made me think you were evil. And you're not. You just like to lie. It's your goddamn hobby. Make the goddamn bed again. In the last month of the first year of my first decade, my father prevents me from charging into the room where the older kids are playing and snatching up all their toys and charging off by feeding me peanut butter on a spoon, or in my language, pin panner on a poon. My brother Frank says on behalf of Lucy, Kathy, and Steve, thanks for dealing with the hurricane, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll be back. In the meantime, please welcome Sarah Kozinski. So, uh, one of my favorite books is The Little Prince, and uh, my favorite scene is, is the part where he meets this fox who um, asks the prince to tame him and says, One only understands the things that one tames. <laughs> Fox taming. Before we met, the storm had nothing to say to me. Reading The Little Prince to you in our eleventh year, I remember how I longed to be tamed, to feel the fox's fear, not of men or guns, but of loving the prince who would leave him. To feel the prince's patience as he lay still in the grass, not understanding, but granting this gift of sadness. This is how you came to me, slow afternoon sitting nearer and nearer, not touching, until smell is enough to reassure us, to ease the tug of distance. If you'd told me you had another planet to be getting on to, I could have begged you to tame me anyway. When you've left me, I shall love the storm clouds that brood in all the grays of your hair. In touch. I crouch on the stoop, blowing nicotine over your bent head. You pull crabgrass one blade at a time to save the odd leaves sprigs that might be something you planted. Most things die out here beside the weeds. Last summer, the aloe reddened and curled in days. Water sucked from its pores. Now the rain-thick ground looks almost like real dirt. Red flowers pucker from one finger of sage. Too urban for plants out of pots, I made my garden on the shelf. Basil tall as a stretched hanger, catnip seeded too close, grown wild as hair. I burrowed my fingers in loosened soil, say I'm trying to get in touch with the earth. You say you are the earth. I flick my smoke into the bag of weeds, dirt tangled in their roots. If I can't return to the garden across razor-edged grass, I'll touch you instead. Consumers. In Binghamton, I had to call every endocrinologist in the book to find one who'd help me get on testosterone. Albany had a whole transgender support group off Lark Street. A woman guided me to a folding chair, said she could teach me to be a man, and I could teach her to be a woman. I was, too, I was too polite to tell her she knew how to be a, a woman, and I knew how to be me. <laughs> Bussing up to the group where no one is defined by their mental illnesses, the Albany trans group is what I'm praying this one won't be like. I'm hoping to see Ariel or James, but I'd take any ward mate. There's no one I know, so I talk to no one, except when required by the ritual icebreaker the group recitation of rules. 
We are called consumers, as if consumption were a better basis for identity than illness. Walking around the darkened mall to the nearest bus stop, I remember James calling himself crazy in front of the nurse. We try not to use those kinds of words, she said. I'm too polite to tell the consumers, be whatever you want, just call me crazy. <laughs> This one starts with a bit from the Odyssey, Achilles speaking to Odysseus. Better, I say, to break sod as a farmhand for some poor countryman on iron rations than lord it over all the exhausted dead. Achilles in Hades. The living visit rarer now. Only Persephone comes and goes, and she bears no news. Season turns her out and back again. Warm as snow. Patroclus makes better of it than I. None we knew remain above, he said, his thumb hooked in his empty scabbard. In life, I was his sovereign. Here, the trappings of rank dissolve like salt. Here, I am the horse straining at air, shadow of clenched muscle and sweat. He the hand on my neck, stroking me quiet. Who living make poor guests anyway? Cool Odysseus plied me with blood for prophecy. That slim animal shadow of life tempted me beyond bearing. I could only drink or fade. Those who came living always return, quick though they once were to taunt us. New shades crowd longer at the shore, wavering like heat in dust. While I brooded at the beach of Troy, Apollo stripped Patroclos, split his shaft, ash torn apart at the grain before Hector in wild thrust could pin his thigh to earth. His body the gods granted me, his skin in tatters, rumpled as the bed we laid him on. I never told Odysseus all. Patroclos is there, lying in what pretends to be grass in this unlight. Shadow of bronze covers shadow of flesh. Dust rises everywhere to the knees, trapped shadows. None of us stirred it. Patroclos' callous palm lifts above, calling me near. Better to haunt Styx's far bank than to rule all waking life without him. When I crossed, Patroclos was waiting, flickering in water light. We are ash in one urn. Routine is such a weird word to apply in these situations. <laughs> the routine surgery <laughs> cells vibrating from the electric hum of machines and voices. I seek sanctuary in the empty hospital chapel, slouching in the front row before the Easter lilies and the cross. I feel all the inconvenience of my newfound atheism as the urge to pray squeezes me like a capped tube. <laughs> I want to die, failing as I am, to satisfy your one request, to be at peace. But you would miss me if you wake. <laughs> Sexy, buggy, robot love. <laughs> you fill my SIM card with I love yous. I wait to delete until the phone flashes its warning. Memory like mine, too crowded to accommodate new arrivals. <laughs> there is a hard drive. There is a hard drive. <laughs> where files may be stored, inaccessible, perhaps <laughs> corrupted. If I ever find again what it was you said to me, could I see the words amid rows of infecting Pope, zeros written over our past? <laughs> I wandered the wilderness for Pesach today, a wilderness two miles asphalt lined with houses and laundromats. The promised land, a grocer whittled down to matzah, dubious horseradish, the last can of macaroons. Already my skin blisters, calf cramps. 
Who am I, rankled by afternoon's heat, to think I would have borne forty years? I can't wonder why we once preferred the bull of our own hands to some bodiless pillar of smoke and flame leading us who knows where. <laughs> Checkpoint. After the bus at the head of the line is deboarded, inspected, and reboarded, the dew faced khaki clad blonde asks us if we're citizens. All three of you, she asks. Yes, we chorus a second time. <laughs> we're all white, so our word is good. I couldn't bear to be kept from you, the way borders are thrust between other lovers. After the blonde releases us, I'm impatient with every pause every mile that divides me from you. If I'd been born a little south instead of a lot east, iron might divide us. The glass glitter of Albuquerque reflects below as we top the last hill. Soon, you'll be holding me. Soon, the dew-faced blonde will stop someone she won't let pass. Purusha's body torn. This is the name you call yourself in this world, in this life, before the world unmakes itself and tears to birth again. These are the clothes you wear, this bag of sinew, the way you only eat grapefruit with a jagged spoon, the nails you dig in your palms, the temper sealed just under the skin. You cling to the yellow daffodils springing from puddled concrete, you think the petals bruised between fingers prove you're real. If the gods tore you to bits like Purusha, would you see how a universe can burst from one man? Adam of Purusha's eye. He watched the world every morning through the same frame, leaves turning to the sun, strip of asphalt, dawn coral in the sky. Even that changes. Pink shades to gray, leaves clog gutters, the sun lingers longer beneath adobe walls. Do you wonder what it will be when the blinded sun wakes you from night's final cocoon? You think it will be you. <laughs> Me and God at the boardwalk arcade. Or rather, I at the adult arcade by the mall, not drinking, lobbing skee-balls, ears plugged against the roar of fans pulling bits of Pac-Man and Candy Crush, hidden in glossy plastic shells empty of oceans. For moments, I leave all the world but arm and ball, thud and roll, bounce and fall, and listen for the clap of your sandals on splintering boards, breathe for the scent of the Atlantic between my blood cells. You are like that now, in me, sea foam floating on the machine wall. Does it offend you that I no longer think you exist? <laughs> Lend me a quarter, and I'll reconsider. <laughs> <laughs> Etiquette for job seekers. Do not cross your legs or hang them open. The deciders, <laughs> the deciders are great believers in the angles a sentence makes, and the knowledge measurable in degrees. Do not ask questions. They must believe you know everything. Yes, even where the bathroom is. <laughs> Do not slatch your shoulders and twist your fingers so. They'll think you're hiding something in the dimensions dancing inside the space-time between your palms, behind your chest. Do not expect them to know. They don't know you. These uh, next couple poems have to do with how I came to live in New Mexico. Sons. When the midwife held him towards me, I raised my hands, palms out. She thought to take him. If I could have spoken, I'd have said, not me. As soon as I could stand, I only wanted to get out of the family clog den, to be alone. <clears throat> For the first time in months, my body was my own. <clears throat> When my nephew learned I'd carried him, he wanted his birth father to be you. No such hurdles will snag your son and me, born a month apart. 
The night we three exchanged musics, the echo of your voice, your face and his nearly unsaddled me. When his cats curled in your lap, I thought, maybe he smells like you. I'm tempted to think there'll be a piece of you left when he's gone, like me, someone to mourn with. I remember before my nephew was born, how he would prop himself heel to rib, head to cervix, and stretch with more might than any, any fetus should have. I haven't learned much else ten years since. I haven't been around to answer questions he hasn't asked. I wonder if, like you with your son, I'll have to wait till he grows up before I know how to speak to him. Sometimes you don't know still. Seeing how your son rides your voice, I don't believe mine will ever find reins to hang on to in me. I know nothing of horses. Complications. Toothbrush hitting the wrong nerve at the back of my throat. I gag and squirt into my sweats. Ten years ago, the midwife's pool in the jungle with the blue mist and the pink mist and the yellow mist <laughs> put my brother to sleep. I couldn't speak to say, how silly. When it was done, I wanted only to wash and sleep. Calming the wall, swaying before the empty shower, bleeding, I said, I'm waiting for energy to get over to the tub. <laughs> it won't come, the midwife the printer said. She was sure two months later my depression was grief over giving up Isaac. Wrong. If I'd known then, I'd have chosen Prozac over Isaac. Stayed in New York. Never loved you. Later, I tucked cabbage leaves in my bra to draw the milk from my aching breasts. The midwife said I roared like a lion, like an old birthing pro, though it was my first and only. Ten years later, all I have to show are a delta, a delta of fading stretch marks and a leaky bladder. <laughs> and a person. <laughs> <laughs> Anonymous. At the show ending my semester of art modeling while pregnant, an artist stepped beside me as I observed his grand canvas where I, unrecognizable with skull face and bone baby and belly, lay on a metal gurney ringed in by skeletal surgeons. I hope you don't mind, he said. Now I make it a poem when I've forgotten his name. So there? <laughs> <laughs> For the record, I didn't mind. <laughs> Naughty things. When my eyes focus, your form drags them through the half-open door into the mirror, where you reflect in all your nakedness through the glass shower. I flip through the book on your bed of naughty things to say to your partner, read a couple aloud. <laughs> When I tell you what I haven't done in bed, you tell me Tom says he'll always remember me as that sexy freak. I stare at the carpet, the bomb, my feet, and laugh. With the second poetry thing of the day, your breast resting on the lip of the towel flashes before me when I'm trying to listen. I think, what a poem I'll write. I think, I can't possibly write a poem about this. <laughs> <laughs> the other ward. Mr. Samuel, a mouth of God's professional descendants, deliver visions of presidents from outer space, con-shaped insults. It's my first time on the other wing of the locked ward, the one you thought was probably for the violent ghosts. I'm here because I threw everything I had, tissues, styrofoam cup, paperback, against the walls of my empty chamber in purgatory. I mean psych emergency then threw myself against the chair, hard enough to rock it back before it fell with a crack that brought the nurse in to scold me for disturbing the other ghosts in other rooms, and then for quietly punching my thigh. The same nurse who triggered my panic by sending you away, by lying that you were too tired to wave and kiss me on my way to hell. Who asked if you were my father and made a face when I said no, husband. Who asked a second time, do you feel safe at home? and watched my eyes as if distrusting my simple yes. I couldn't speak to say, yes, I am safe with the man who brought me here rather than let me kill myself. 
But who believes ghosts who claim they're not dead? In hell, I go to my room, lie on my cot, grateful it isn't in a hallway this time. Jesus is dead, but someone said he's watching me in fat crayons on the ceiling above my bed. The evidence. Collecting evidence of life from the years I wasn't dead, but hibernating. I unearthed whole continents of self laying asleep beneath the deep snow of unsloughed skin. The evidence is paper and ink, scattered and stacked. On one scrap I wrote, I know you want me to say it's the sex, but the best thing you do to me is read. <laughs> and I could punch myself, now I want to fuck you every day and you can't want the same. <laughs> but why should I write of your drug-impaired libido? I refer the reader to all you wrote of mine. <laughs> we read to each other every day now. Your voice licks my ear and we have it. Evidence of life. <laughs> the White Hole Goddess and the Thirteen-Year King. You find me bound to this oak by heavy vines twisting from ankles and wrists. The gods did not bind me. I did. You want to cut me loose. You've brought the knife. You slashed the vines. Tell me again nothing was ever my fault. Convince me even. Still, the green shoots of guilt thicken my bonds faster than you can cut them. You didn't think a myth with a king hanging on an oak was going to have a happy ending. <laughs> You say the crown doesn't suit me. Prod a golden spike, or is it a thorn? Show, and show me the blood beating on your fingertip, a white hole birthing a new sun. Goddess that you are, still my guilt is not yours to pardon. <coughs> I say I'll try not to be a black hole devouring all your bloody stars, lucky or not. Reaching to drink the sap from my mouth, you say I am the black hole that feeds them. <coughs> Sunday stroll. If anyone were near enough on the Sunday empty campus, they'd hear in the shortness of my breath, not the labored pant, but the heated gasp of being a physical body among physical bodies. Tree and lamppost, concrete and sky, till inattention turns my steps to the main street and quiets me. I let my hair fall before my face till I can reappear as social animal and conceal the bliss of muscle pulling bone under skin. One more uh, about uh, why we're leaving in New Mexico. Crossing Puget Sound, I say how unlike the odor of the Atlantic. Not noticing yet, I don't mean I still miss that childhood shade of brine. Months later, my nose is still full of it. So you'll come with me back to water. We'll let the desert sands run out, at least the ones we don't carry there with us, the grains that may spill sometimes when we blink. from my latest book, which is back there, The Shining Air. <clears throat> it mostly focuses around my two hip replacement surgeries I just had, and I'm not going to read you any of those poems. <laughs> it also has a bunch of prose poems involving usually some horribly embarrassing uh, situation from my past, and here's one of those. <clears throat> the reason, compared to real writers, I think I spend maybe half an hour a week on average actually producing. Today I was feeling like I ought to shut myself in a room for an hour every day and see what rose up. What rose up today was a kid named Mervyn. 
If I was a ghastly weakling in grade school and junior high, every bully's idea of a worthless little victim, Mervyn was depths below me. I at least had two friends. We'd stand against the red brick wall and watch Mervyn get it. The bullies wove complex paths like bus routes through the playground, always involving some indignity to Mervyn. He was toothless for one thing. Sometime in seventh grade, all his teeth had needed removed due to who knew what horrible ailment. He walked around for months, it felt like, with a smushed-in face. The bullies competed to think of words he couldn't pronounce and make him say them. Then he showed up with dentures. Everyone thought the dentures were sort of cool, so he got a fleeting reprieve. But puberty was looming, and the bullies changed focus to Mervyn's obvious perversion and poor sexual vocabulary. You beat your meat, don't you, Mervyn? Mervyn, you beat your meat? It was the first time I'd heard that phrase to know about Mervyn. My friends and I never did anything one way or the other except watch. The thing is, before finding them, I'd been friends with Mervyn. One night we went camping together in the scuzzy local forest, the Middlesex Fells. I don't think we had sleeping bags or a tent, just blankets. Ate something that didn't need a fire. Lay awake on ground so uneven it was like being crammed in a pit half up a slope. I remember black and sounds in it, and both of us hardly speaking a word, we were so terrified. That night was the reason I treated Mervyn like a stranger from then on. It was also the reason I shouldn't have. <coughs> uh, one of the things I'm going to miss is going up to Santa Fe with Sarah every month for an appointment, and uh, riding the rail running. This is a poem from that. Train, Pueblo Land. The snow defers to the black bushes, but the sky has a thickness in its color. Slopes and gullies fold upward into it, breathed by eras of lost stone. Then the choking little roads and driveways spasmodically white, with here and there tail lights on crouched metal. Beside me you work on your story, one of the ways your head is a downward head this morning. Ink marks and cuts on your thumb look like each other. The city starts to push into the window. After sex last night in that sleepy together sprawl, I told you this is the best part. You made a low smile sound, too drooped to disagree. I know you thought I meant the best part of sex. I meant the best part of my life. <laughs> I, I don't know what this poem is about. I, uh, I wrote it right after going to a wonderful reading involving Lisa Gill, Tommy Arness, Kat Etherington, and Aaron Daughtry at a gallery downtown. Some of you were there. This is what I wrote after listening to them. Mosaic. This child only trails wind along a sidewalk and sweats gold over laid out parents. The parents believe what the night believes. Metal twirling on an axis, flashing blind. Slide by slide, the child limps water footmarks. Kind lion who rips the reflections from their mirrors. Kind lion, roar the child's city behind him. Roar caves of trees for whiter voices. Under the lover's night sky, the oceans hang in buckets, swiveling cord, gaped at the fish's freedom. The lovers, worlds together, hurry to be still, with the lifting of pain and pleasure into a river weed, smooth clot of brown roads. They stare into faces instantly their own and forget, and hear the child echo, impaling them on his cries. They're lovers. They keep everyone's secrets. We won't outnumber the oceans after a while. They haul at their story, rough, bitter in ropes. Wind has never named them or done anything but behead them in play. They have a dry structure as their mystery. The lovers will fall away and parent the floor again. The child will meet the lion at the tops of unclimbed trees. The roads will untie. We will always be literary. The mirrors turn the world around that fast. First grandchild was born in May. Mirabai leaves. 
This is called My Son and I Await My Granddaughter in Different Cities. Night goes home with itself, hands wet the towel, the room's less a cube than a single shadow. Today's date is a house rising and falling, foreboding how soft and liquid pain is for you. For me, today's date is a tall feather of light through the door, like a shim of green plaster. The toes on my good foot jump like lightning. The dog stops barking and the voices pool home. Ice blue May after the sun seeps in the razor sight lines. But good hot dark, good bread of the body pumps full this place of knowing death for me. For you, birth has to come first across a water and the water flies your way. Uh, sometime soon I expect to be able to stop regarding Albuquerque as home, but it ain't happened yet. <laughs> Bull Canyon. The streets catch fire, fire transparent and multicolored. Heavily blue spruce ekes footholds in front of one of the tawdrier frats. The mountain opens itself, but only to snow. A cane, at least, is imminent for me. I'm never bored by these things I've seen most of my life, but can't imagine seeing them for the last time, either. What might the Northwest be like, 30 years later, and the future conquered by the present, and the past dead by its own hand? If answering that involves me changing, am I silly to ask? A man offers me a buck to use my phone. I lie, I don't have one on me. No hesitation. Smile. Yesterday it rained like the Northwest, and I felt indifferently ready. Today is blue, adjusted to that unassuming fire I invented for this poem. Blue with strengthless cloud, honed breeze, deep ardor of home. And these last two poems also have fire in them for some reason. This is, this is fire poem. <laughs> Would anyone need to read what's written on these papers that fly upward from the fire? Do the letters of the words glow as they die? Here is a town speeding through time beside a river. Here a boy standing still in the dirt with a fishing pole, watching the town blur around him. His smooth machines appear, the river poison itself, the billboards swarm with unhappy women with smiles. Put the boy in the fire so he can begin to change. He needs his paper town to shrivel. It got away from him. He was happy with his strange blank parents and the cows who moved their jaws, whose eyes glistened, and the store with the candy and shallow bins. But those are gone under time, under a crackle of plastic and wire. Put the boy in the fire. The town has become enemy dirt for his bare feet. Who would need to read the papers that tell of him, that he looks from, that escape in the updraft? No, the letters darken, only the fire glows. <coughs> Excuse me. And this last poem is one of the most recent things I've written in New Mexico. Um, during the uh, Doghead Fire, um, Lisa Gill was. Uh, uh, posting on Facebook about how she could, you know, walk to the end of the ridge where she lived and see it coming. And I was in a totally different situation. I was uh, sitting on my bed recovering from surgery, and uh, I knew the fire was happening somewhere way over there beyond the mountains. And that, uh, that difference, contrast, um, led to this poem. Lisa, menaced by wildfire. <laughs> It was always a thought of yours, because everything to think is a thought of yours, that the word home might refer to land that could be burnt, and wood, metal, fur, skin, thought itself that could be burnt. But now, you start off in the odor of it, to see it waiting over the next hill, and not waiting, lighting the air, a squat bramble in a spotted line like water, but not water. You hear things... Not about how soon, but how now towns are evacuating. Even to drive to a meeting half a mile away, you're unwilling to leave your dog here. Smoke no longer an imprecise signal, a precise panic. Pack, 
snap and upload these photos of how the air is reds and blacks that don't belong to it. The point your Zen teachers wanted you to see where thought becomes no thought. Nothing is in your head but what waits over the next hill and escape. I check Facebook around midnight. Cutting the oxycodone down to one every six hours meant it couldn't do its job. Maybe one every four hours, two every six. The pain reminds me of that wave of fire waiting, creeping, shrinking, gathering opportunity. It's banked back, but the nausea returns, the blunted sense, fingers hitting the wrong keys at an annoying rate. As advertised, the drug takes the edge off the pain, so the pain is there, a definite itch and sear, but not a blade that cuts every experience open. One-ish, there are new photos, and you've talked to people who've been under falling ash. Your mom reminds you that flames could be a hundred feet high, yet whole mountain ranges away up here. Seeing doesn't equal near. You're packing in order of love and going to need. Sounds like leisurely, but I know the literal muscular strain propelling the leisure. Being on alert lists, spying firefighter camps nearby, can't help your peculiar problem. Is it turning this way? I know where it is. I have my back to it, sitting up on the edge of my bed, letting the currents in my leg have some change. Behind me, behind those mountains. Mm. Thanks for coming. We love you. Help yourself to water. And uh, I'll see you sometime. All right. <laughs> see you online.